Okay, so this week we are talking about analysis of variance, chapter 11 of the textbook. And a different name for analysis of variance is ANOVA. So if you take, and the textbook refers to it as ANOVA, and if you take a stats class in the future, more advanced stats class, and you hear the term ANOVA, it's talking about this procedure, which is the analysis of variance procedure. Now, what is ANOVA? So ANOVA is an inferential statistic technique designed to test for significant relationships between two variables in two or more samples. Okay. Now the logic is the same as the t-test, just extended to independent variables with two or more samples. So to clarify that, what, what does that mean? Okay. Now we've learned about a couple of inferential statistic techniques already in the class. We learned about the t-test, we learned about chi-square. Now I told you you would use the t-test if your dependent variable is measured at the interval ratio level. Okay. And you would use chi-square when you have either nominal and or ordinal level data. Okay. Well, why would you use ANOVA if you already have those two procedures? Now, you would use ANOVA if your dependent variable is measured at the interval ratio level. However, you have more than two samples. Because if you remember with the t-test, we learned about a one-sample t-test, and we also learned about a two-sample t-test. Okay. So if you were doing a one sample t test. So the t test. What you would do is you would pull one sample from the population and you would compare that sample mean to some specified value. So if you're doing a one sample, doing a one sample t test, your research hypothesis might look something like that. The, the, re this, the research hypothesis that we used was the mean wages of blacks, so we had mu represent the population mean wages for blacks in the population, okay? Because again, we're doing inferential statistic techniques. We're not concerned about the sample, we're using the sample to infer about the population, so we used mu, and we said that the mean wage of African Americans in the population was less than the mean wages of all Americans, which we said was 28,985, okay? So that was the value that we're comparing it to, okay? So we pulled one sample. The null hypothesis, of course, was a statement of no difference, contradicted the research hypothesis, which would say that the mean wage of African Americans in the population was equal to the mean wages of all Americans. And so that's how you do a one sample t test. Now, you could also do a t test if you had two samples. So, a two sample t test, you could do something similar in the sense that you could look at the mean wages of African Americans, let's just say that, and you might say that the mean wage of African Americans is less than the mean wages of white Americans, okay? So you could do a two sample t-test. This time we're doing a one sample, we're doing one sample. We're comparing it to some specified value that we as a researcher decide on. But if we're doing a two sample t-test, we're pulling two samples out of the population. We're comparing the two sample means to see in the population are the two means equal, okay? And of course, the null hypothesis would say that the two means in the population are equal. Okay, so we can do a one sample t-test and we can do a two sample t-test. Now, you're gonna use ANOVA when your dependent variable is measured at the interval ratio level, but you have more than two samples, okay? Because I can compare the mean wages of African Americans to the mean wages of white Americans, or I'd say that they're less than. But let's just say that I wanted to compare the mean wage of African Americans to the mean wage of white Americans, to the mean wages of Asian Americans, to the mean wage of Latino Americans, to the mean wages of Native Americans. What would I have to do in that situation if I'm doing the t-test? Well, first I would have to compare the mean wage of African Americans to the mean wage of white Americans. Then I'd have to compare the mean wage of African Americans to the mean wages of Asian Americans, then the mean wage of African Americans to the mean wage of Latinos, then the mean wage of African Americans to the mean wages of Native Americans, okay? But I wouldn't be done, see? Because then I'd have to go compare the mean wage of white Americans to the mean wage of Asian, mean wage of white Americans to the Latino white to Native Americans, still not done, Asians to Latinos, Asians to Native Americans, and so on and so forth. So, and then after I'm done with all those separate t-tests, I still don't know about the relationship between all of these groups, okay? So that's what ANOVA does. It is, it's essentially like the t-test. It compares means in the population, 
except unlike the t-test it can use more than two samples it can use three four you know and uh, five six etc samples okay so like i said logic is the same as in the t-test just extended to independent variables with two or more samples so it's an inferential statistic technique we're comparing means in the population we're using sample data okay so we're going to talk about one-way ANOVA today, because this textbook talks about one-way ANOVA. There's actually two-way ANOVA um, as well, but this textbook doesn't talk about it, so we're not going to discuss it, and you're not going to be tested on that. Just be aware that if you take more advanced stats class and stats classes in the future, you may see two-way two ANOVA. So one-way ANOVA is analysis of various procedures using one independent and then one dependent variable. Okay. Now, the way ANOVA works, now I've tried to explain this many times to many different classes, and I think some people get it, but I feel like every single time that I explain it, I actually end up confusing students more than if I just hadn't said anything to begin with. But in the most simplistic way to think about how ANOVA works is you have these different samples, okay? Let's just say we have, you know, either black, you know, white, Asian, Latinos, you know, Native Americans and so on. So we have like these five different groups. What you would do with the ANOVA procedure is you're gonna compare the amount of variation or the amount of differences you see between the groups, you know, between blacks versus whites versus Asians versus Latinos versus you know, Native Americans, to the amount of variation or the amount of differences that we see within these samples themselves, okay? Now, if there's more variance and differences between the samples and between the groups than there are within the samples or within the groups themselves, then that suggests that in the population, the means are not equal. The means of all these groups are not equal, okay? Um, now, that's essentially the way it works. If you don't understand that, you're not gonna be tested on it and it really doesn't necessarily matter if you uh, understand that logic per se, but that is the way that it, that it works. So we're gonna compare the amount of variation or the amount of differences between the samples to the amount of variation or the amount of differences within the samples themselves. Now, I actually posted a video um, here, the chapter 11 lecture, that it's like a four minute video that kind of helps you to understand and illustrates this concept. So if you wanna watch that, you can check that out. But it's essentially what I said, where, we, where you're comparing the amount of variation between groups to the amount of variation within groups, okay? Now, when you're doing this ANOVA procedure, it, you're gonna follow the same five steps that we followed with the t-test and the chi-square test, okay? First step. We're going to make assumptions. If we meet these assumptions, we can use this procedure. Okay. Second step, we're going to state the research. The research hypothesis is the hypothesis that we as a researcher believe to be the case. Then we're going to write below that state the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis that the statement of no difference, it contradicts the research hypothesis. Okay? And what we go about doing is we assume the null hypothesis is true during the test, and we see whether or not our sample data casts doubt on that assumption. Okay? Uh, ideally, what we want to do is we want to reject the null, the null hypothesis, which then provides support for our research hypothesis. But of course, there's two options. We can either reject the null or we fail to reject the null, okay? So we state our research, we state our null, select the alpha level, same alpha levels as we used for the t-test in the chi-square. We're using 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001 alpha level. We would, we would just report all three, okay? Step number three, we're gonna select the sampling distribution and specify the test statistic, okay? So the sampling distribution that we will be using for the ANOVA procedure will be the distribution of the F. And then the test statistic that we will calculate is the F obtained or the F statistic F ratio. Okay, a couple different names for it. 
Fourth thing that we're going to do, compute the test statistic. So you're going to learn about the math behind how to compute the test statistic. And then after we compute that test statistic, we're going to make a decision and interpret the results. When we say make a decision and interpret the results, we're determining whether or not we're going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so let's talk about the assumption. Okay. So the first assumption that you need to meet when you're doing the ANOVA procedure is that you're using independent random samples. Okay. Now, we already talked about what a random sample is, so there's no point in like going over that again. What is an independent random sample? So what that means is that our choice of sample members from one population has no effect on the choice of members from subsequent populations. What does that mean? So let's just say that I want to do a study where I'm comparing the mean wages of blacks, whites, Asians, Latinos, and then Native Americans. So I'm just going to put down blacks, we have whites, we have Asians, we have Latinos, we have Native American. Okay, so we want to compare the mean wages of all these groups. And let's just say in the Coachella Valley. Okay. Now, if I were trying to sample the population of the Coachella Valley, it'd be relatively easy for me to find white people to sample. Okay. It'd also be relatively easy for me to find Latinos to sample as well. Might be a little bit more difficult to find some Asians and some African Americans. And if that's the case, Sometimes what people do in order to find that population and to go about finding a sample from that population is they might ask people that they already know, or maybe even people in, the sam in, in one of the other samples. So let's just say that I was doing a study on the mean wages of blacks versus whites versus Asians versus Latinos versus Native Americans in the Coachella Valley. Now again, I found some whites for the sample, I found some Latinos for the sample, but let's just say I'm running into an issue with finding Asians. Okay. Then I go about, and I'm okay. Well, would you happen to know where the large Asian community is in the Coachella Valley? And I ask this from the white respondents, and they tell me, okay, well, I know some Asian people, so here's their number, and then you can sample them. Okay, so then I sample this group of people. Okay, though that sample is no longer independent, if I am getting people for this sample based upon, you know, some type of like, you know, reference from another sample. And the reason why that's problematic, let's just say I'm comparing the main wages of blacks, white, Asian, Latino, Native Americans, and I run into some whites in the sample, and then I just so happen to pull a bunch of wealthy, rich white people for the sample. You know, let's just say whites tend to be wealthier in, in the Coachella Valley. Okay? Now, when I ask these people, do they know some Asian Americans that I can sample? They might, but in all likelihood, they're gonna know Asians that are also wealthy and relatively well off, okay? Why? Because people from the same social class tend to interact with each other more often than people from different social classes, okay? So what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have a biased sample where I'm gonna have mostly rich or wealthier Asian people. Same situation, if I run into a situation where I am you know, I have a bunch of poor white people in, in, in my sample. And I ask, okay, uh, do you know where I can find some Asians so that I can get into my sample as well? And they tell me, oh, I know some Asians. In all likelihood, because like I said, people from the same social class tend to interact with each other more than people from different social classes. They would refer me to poor Asians, which would then, again, bias that sample. So I would have both poor Asians and poor whites because these samples aren't independent. So that's what that first assumption means, is that our samples are independent. That is, the members from one group do, do not affect or influence who gets into the subsequent population. Now, the second assumption that needs to be met in order for the ANOVA procedure to work is that our dependent variable is measured at the interval ratio level. So like I said, this is kind of like the t-test in the sense that we want our dependent variable to be measured at the interval ratio level. Now. Having said that, some researchers do apply ANOVA to ordinal level data. Um, so if you, again, transfer to the university, you're working under a professor who is using ANOVA for ordinal level data, 
I don't want you to say, okay, well, Professor Cathcart said it doesn't work. Technically it does. ANOVA is one of the most abused and misused statistical procedure out there, okay? So you're not supposed to use it for ordinal level data, but people do it all the time, okay? Um, if you are t going to use ANOVA for ordinal level data, one thing that is important is that you are using ordinal level data that has a lot of categories. What do I mean by a lot of categories? Just say you're using social class and you have upper, middle, and lower class, those are, you only have three categories for that variable. And if you're doing ANOVA with social class, you are not going to be able to get this procedure to work properly, okay? Now, SPSS or whatever statistical you know, software you're using, it'll spit something out, but it won't be meaningful, okay? In order for ANOVA to work, with ordinal level data, you need ordinal level data that has a lot of categories. And what do I mean by a lot of categories? Looking like at something like income that is, let's just say, put into ordinal level data. So looking at something like where you're looking at income, where it's like 100,000, 95, 90, 85, 80, 75, 70, 65, 60, uh, 55, 50, and so on and so forth. Because that'd be enough categories to where you could almost treat this ordinal level data as if it's interval ratio, even though it's not, okay? But again, just in general, the textbook says that you can't use uh, ANOVA with ordinal level data, so that, that, that might be something that you wanna to try to memorize for the exam, okay? Third assumption, we wanna make sure that the population is normally distributed, okay? Now again, we just assume that the population, uh, the variable in the population that we're pulling from is normally distributed, However, because we're sampling, we don't have that population data. So we're never really going to know whether or not the population is normally distributed. So we just kind of assume that it is. The other thing that we do is we make sure that our sample size is 50 or larger because that makes me that our sampling distribution is normal. Okay? And then the last thing that we assume is that the population variances are equal. Again, we're talking about population data something that we'll never truly know. So again, we just assume that the population variances are equal in order for this procedure to work. And then we also take a look at these sample variances and the sample variances look relatively close. Then we proceed uh, with the procedure because we never really have that population data if we're sampling. Okay, so after we make the assumption and we meet the assumption, we can use the procedure. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to state our research hypothesis and then we're going to state our null hypothesis, okay? Now, when you're writing the research hypothesis for the ANOVA procedure, the only thing that you're going to say is that at least one of the means is different from the others, okay? So one of the means in the population amongst all the groups that you're comparing is going to be different from the others. Now, this is one of the limitations of the ANOVA procedure, okay? One of the big limitations, okay? So if you have only two samples, ideally, you're going to want to use the t-test. Okay. If you have three or more samples, you need to use the ANOVA procedure. But if you have two, one or two samples, you, ideally, you'd prefer to use the t-test. The reason why is because the t-test is more specific. Now, what do I mean by the t-test is more specific? When you're doing the ANOVA procedure, it's going to let you know whether or not all the means are equal in the population or not, okay? What it does not tell you, what it does not tell you is which, which mean is not equal, okay? Which mean is higher or which mean is lower? To elaborate on that, let's take a look at this. So let's just say we're comparing blacks versus whites versus Asian versus Latino versus Native American, okay? Now we think, maybe we as the researchers believe that whites and Asians are gonna make more than these other groups. Or maybe we as researchers think that, I don't know, blacks and Native Americans are gonna make less than these other groups, okay? Now with the t-test, I can specify that. I can say that the mean wages of African Americans, if I'm doing a two sample, is gonna be less than the mean wages of white Americans, okay? But with the ANOVA procedure, I can't specify that. I can't say which mean is gonna be greater, which mean is gonna be lower, and I also can't say if it's gonna, if the means are gonna be higher or lower. Another thing is I can't say, well, let's just say I believe that two of them are gonna be higher. Let's just say I think that both whites 
and Asians, their means are going to be higher than all these other groups. I can't specify that. Okay. If I think that the mean wages of blacks and Native Americans is going to be lower, I can't specify that. Okay. So I can't specify which means higher, which means lower. And if it's going to be two of the means are going to be higher, two of the means are going to be lower, three of the means are going to be higher, three of the means are going to be lower, I can't specify any of that. Okay. So the ANOVA procedure doesn't tell you any of that. The only thing that it tells you is that at least one of these means is different from the other ones. Which one's different? It doesn't tell you that. Is the one that different, is it higher or lower? ANOVA doesn't tell you that either. So that's why I said, like I said, if, ideally if you only have two samples, you'd prefer to use the t-test. But if you have more than two samples, you're going to use the ANOVA procedure. Does that make sense to people? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Okay. So the research hypothesis says that at least one of these means is different from the others. Doesn't specify which one, doesn't specify higher or lower. It just says one of them is different. Okay. Now the null hypothesis is saying the opposite. It is saying that no, there's, it's a statement of no difference. It's saying that all the means of all these different groups is equal to each other. So you'd write the null hypothesis saying that the means for one group in the population is equal to the other group in the population, which is equal to the other group, which is equal to the other group, and they're all equal, so there is no difference. So the null hypothesis would be a statement of no difference. Um, so that's how you go about stating the research and the null hypothesis for the ANOVA procedure. Like I said, it's a pretty big limitation, but like I said, if you have more than two samples, this is, this is what you're gonna be using. So this is gonna be the data, so let's forget the whole discussion about mean wages. Let's look at the mean years of education for these four groups. Okay, so let's just say we pulled four samples from a population. Um, let's say we pulled white males, black males, white females, black females. So we have four samples. And I want to know whether or not in the population are the mean years of educational attainment for these different groups equal. And so I pulled some sample data. Um, the ends are really small because this procedure takes, I wouldn't say super long time, but the math behind it kind of takes a long time. So if you had like, you know, hundreds for each sample, it would just take forever. Um, so we're just going to use, you know, sample size of 21 people for all the samples put together. So there were six white males, four black males, six white females, by black females, okay? And we're gonna use this data to compare whether or not the mean years of educational attainment amongst these four, di four different groups is equal in the population. So in order to do this, the first step of this ANOVA procedure to, in order to calculate the compute the test statistic, the F ratio or the F obtained, would be to find the between group sum of squares. Okay. Now what does the between group sum of squares tell us? It tells us the difference between the groups. Because like I said, the ANOVA procedure works by comparing the amount of variance or the amount of differences between groups to the amount of variance or the amount of differences within these samples themselves. So that's what the between group sum of squares will help us to find out. So the between group sum of squares or the SSB is equal to the sum of the nk, so the n is the number of cases in a sample, and then k represents the number of different samples that you have. Now again, we have four samples, so how many n's do we have? We have four n's, okay? Now, you multiply that by y, or with the line number, which is the mean of y, subtract k, minus the overall mean. So y with the line over is just the overall mean, which is the mean of all of the people in all the different samples. Okay, in parentheses, you square that up. Okay, now, before you get to the sigma part, when we're just looking at the n subscript k, so I'm gonna write it up here on this board. So what we're looking at here, You're going to have to do this four times for each sample. You're going to have to do this 
four times. And then after you do this four times, you then add it up and then you get your SSV. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the first one for you so you can see how this works. And then after I do the first one, I want you all to do the other three so we can find the SSV. All right, so let's take a look at this first sample, white males. What is the N for white males? Six. Six, good. So if I look at back at this equation, NK, which is the N of that first sample, is six. Now you'd have to do this again for the second sample as well. So, but for the first sample, white males, it's six, okay? Now I need to find two other pieces of information in order to finish off this equation. The first piece of information I need is the mean of the first sample, which I would put here, and then I would subtract that by the overall mean, which is the mean of all 21 respondents. So how do I know we have 21 respondents? We have six white males, four black males, six white females, uh, five black females. So we have a total of 21 people in the sample. So what I want y'all to do right now, I want y'all to one, tell me the mean for white males, and then two, calculate the mean, the overall mean of all these different groups. Okay, so how do you get the overall mean? Add all the numbers up, and then divide by 21. How do you get the mean for white males? Add these numbers up, and then divide by six. So why don't y'all go ahead and take a minute and uh, do that for me. When somebody gets the uh, mean for white males, uh, let me know. It's 15.66. Right, and we're gonna round it up to 15.67. Now let's go ahead and find the overall mean of all these groups. Um, did anybody get the overall mean? Oh, Y'all can take a little bit more time. Did you say to add all the numbers up together and, or add all the means up and divide by 21? Um, well, don't add all the means up. You can, but if you add all the means up, you're gonna divide by four. But the other thing that you would do is you would just add all the numbers up and then divide by 21. And you should get the same answer. Is it 13.57? The overall mean is 13.57, correct, good. So if you added all these numbers up together and then divided by 21, you should get 13.57, okay? So the mean of the first sample is 15.67. The overall mean is 13.57. Did everybody see how we get, got all these numbers here? Yeah. No. 
Oh, okay. What 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 part didn't you see? Okay, because you said that mean is for each one of the group, right? Mm, okay. So and now you said we have to add all the groups and found one mean. Yeah, so you could, if you found the mean of this group, and then the mean uh -huh. of this group, and then the mean of this group, and then the mean of this group, then you add them together and divide by four, and you should get 13.57. Now, the other way that you could do this is you could just add all these numbers, add, add all these numbers, add all these numbers, add all these numbers, add them all together, and then divide by 21, and you should still get 13.57. So, that, so that's how you get the overall mean. So if we take all 21 respondents, Add up all their scores and then divide by 21, you should get 13.57. Thank you. Okay, cool. So now that everybody knows how we got all these different numbers, now all we're going to do here is follow the order of operation. So we start off with parentheses 15.67 minus 13.57 is going to give us 2.1. Okay, parentheses, then we go to exponents. 2.1 squared gives us. 4.41. 4.41 times 6 gives us, I think, 26.46. 26.46. Now, I did that for the first sample. What you need to do is do it for the other three samples, add them together. So do the sigma part, and then you'll get the SSB. Anybody have any questions? Why don't y'all go ahead and do that? Uh, I'll give you all a couple of minutes and then we will uh, check uh, your answers. So why don't y'all go ahead and give that a shot. Finish the other three, then add them to 26.46. Um, again, I didn't really know how long it takes people to do this. So if anybody has the answer, or thinks they have the answer, just go ahead and like uh, throw it out, and I'll see if you if that's the correct answer.
if you're shy and you have to answer, you can just type it in the chat too. We'll see if that's correct. Um, I got point four. I don't know if I did anything wrong. As your final answer? For N2, for black males? Okay, that might be the right answer for that, but I, I want y'all to like finish it and like get it, get it the whole way, get the SSD. All right. Okay, sorry, my bad. All good. Is it, is it 41.166? Um, no, close enough. So let's just say it was 41.14. Okay, so having said that, let's go ahead and work through it together. Now we already got 26.46, so let's not do that again. Let's just go ahead and like jump over to, I think the next one with black males. The N we know was four, so we put four here. We still have the same overall mean, which is 13.57. What was the mean years of education for black males? 13.25. Okay, good, thank you. 13.25. So we get 13.25 minus 13.57 and we get what? Oh, uh, negative 0.32. Good, negative 0.32. We square that up and we get what? I got 0 0.10. 0 0.10. Let's find that by four and we get what? 0.4. 0 0.40. Okay, so we got, for the first one, we got 26.46. For the next one, we got about 0 0.40. Okay, keep it going. Let's look at the next. For white females, the N was six. What was the mean for white females? 13. 13 minus the same overall mean, which is 13.57. Square that up. All right, so 13 minus 13.57 gives us what? Negative 0.57. We square that up and we get what? Got 0.32. Okay, so we do six times 0.32 and we get what? 1.92. 1.92. Okay. And then we go the last one, which was Five black females. The mean for black females is what? Twelve. Minus thirteen point five seven. Square that up. Well, we we subtract twelve minus thirteen point five seven. We get negative one point five seven. We square that up, and we get what? Two point four six. Two point four six. We we multiply five times two point four six, and we get what? Twelve point three. 
12.3 what? Two. All right, so we go. Once you add these four numbers up, you should get 41.14. Anybody have any questions about that? So the last part of this equation would be the sigma part, which is add them all up. So our SSB is 41.14. Anybody have any questions about that? Cool. So when, you're, when we're doing this, make sure that you keep track of all these numbers too. So our SSB is equal to 41.14 because we're going to need this later on. All right, now that we have that, our next step to calculate is to find the SSW, okay? Now this tells us how much variation we're seeing within the samples themselves, because we, we compare the amount of variation between the samples to the amount of variation within the samples, okay? Now there's two ways to do this. There's the easy way, which is the long way, and then the hard way, which is the shorter way. I'm gonna quickly show you how to do it this way, but if you're doing the homework, you're not gonna do it this way. So I'm just gonna quickly show it and then we're gonna go over to the way that you're supposed to do it for the homework, okay? Now, if you're doing it this way, you're gonna take the sum of the y with subscript i, which means each individual score in the sample. So you're gonna take each individual score in the sample and you're gonna subtract it by the mean of that sample, okay? Which is y with a line over at subscript k, which is the mean of that sample. We already talked about that. So you do that in parentheses, then you square that number up. Okay, so if we were to do that, let's just say with this data here, we have white males, there's six, so the first white male uh, had 16 years of education. So we take score of that individual minus the mean of that sample, which is be 15.67. Okay, we would take 16 minus 15.67 and we would get 0.33, right? So that would be our deviation within the parentheses. Then what we'd have to do is we'd have to square that 0.33 up. And we would get 0.1089. Like I said, this is the easy way, and like I said, it just becomes tedious and pretty long. So then you do that for 16 minus 15.67, get that number squared at 18 minus 15.67, 14 minus 15.67, 14. And you just keep on doing that for, for white males. Then we get over to black males, we get to 16. And we would do 16, but we would do 16 minus 15.67, we would do 16 minus 13.25. So you subtract by the mean of that specific sample, okay? And we'd get that deviation, then we'd square that up, okay? 12 minus 13.25, which is the mean of that sample. Get that deviation squared up. And we keep on doing that till we get all four black males. Then we go to white females. We do 16, okay? And then we subtract it by the mean, which I think the mean was 13 for, for white females, okay? So we would do it for each score in the sample, and we subtract it by the mean of that sample. Now, the way you're gonna have to do it for the homework, you're gonna use this slightly more complex equation. And I'm gonna write this equation up here on this board. We'll talk about what each component is. So we're gonna do the top left part. So this is the sum of the scores of the squared scores from each sample. So what do we mean by that? Is you take each score in the sample, you square it up, and then you sum it up. Okay, then you're gonna subtract it by the sum of, this here is the, the sum of the scores of each sample. So it sounds similar, but it's not. This time you're not squaring it first. You're gonna square it after you sum it up. Then you're gonna divide it by the n of that same sample, okay? Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, what is this? Now, I, I don't know what I'm looking at. Let's just look at this. This part, because we need to solve this first, okay? Now this is the sum of the squared scores from each sample. So what you're gonna do, if we take a look at this PowerPoint. 
So here, if we're looking here, we have the scores, right? Now, if you square these scores up, so 16 times 16 gives us 256. 18 times 18 gives us 324. 14 squared, 196. 14, 196. 16, 256. 16 squared up to 256. So these are all of these numbers squared up. Everybody with me? Now, after I square them, if I were to add them up, it would add up to 1,484. So what I did is I took each score, squared them up, then added them up to 1,484. Now the next sample, I do the exact same thing. 16 to 256, 12 to 144, 11 to 121, 14 to 196, add them all up, and I would get 717. The next sample, square these numbers up. Add them together, and you're gonna get 1,034. Then the last sample, square these numbers up, add them together, and you're going to get 730. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay, good. Now all I do is I just sum all these squared scores up. Now they've already been summed up to 1,484, 717, 1,034, 730. But now they need to all be summed together. So why don't you all go ahead and add those numbers together. So add all the squared scores up together. And then tell me what number should be here. Okay. 3,965. Good, Beatrice. So we should have 3,965 here. Three thousand nine hundred sixty five. Did everybody see how we got this three thousand nine hundred sixty five? Good. So now that we got that, what we need to do at this point is we need to get this part. So we're going to, have to do this four times. Okay. So what you need to do here is you need to sum all the scores up. So here we squared the scores, then summed them up. This time we're not going to square them. We're just going to sum them up. And then after we're done summing them all up, we then square them. And then we divide by the end of that sample. So we're going to do it four times for the four different samples. I'm going to do it for the first one. I want you all to do it for the other three. So let's jump back to this PowerPoint. So I know for the first sample, the N is six, right? So I'm going to do this down here. Our n is 6 for the first sample. And then what I would do, have to do is I would have to sum up all these scores. So I take 16 plus 18 plus 14 plus 14 plus 16 plus 16. That would all add up to 94. So if I sum it all up, sum all the scores up, it's going to sum up to 94. I'm going to take this 94, I'm going to square it up and I'm going to divide by 6. So 94, I'm going to square that up, and then that is going to give me 8,836. I'm going to divide that by 6. And that's going to give me 1,400 and... 72.67. Did everybody see how I got that 1,472.67? Okay, well, so I'll go ahead and knock out the other three, add them up, and once you add all those numbers up, put it here, so subtract it into 3,965. Once you do that, you get your SSW. So why don't I go ahead and like uh, take a couple of minutes and uh, do that. And when you think you got the final answer, just go ahead and uh, let me know and I'll see if you are, you are right.
Um, does anybody have the final answer? I got 3908.92. For the SSW, no. Anybody have a different answer? Oh, oh, I didn't finish, sorry. Oh, okay. So would it be 56.08? Yes, it is. So why don't we go ahead and like uh, do this up here on the board together. All right, so we already got the 1,472.67. Now what we need to do is look over to uh, the black males. So we know that our N is four, so we'll put four down here. We need to look at um, the, if we add all those scores up, it's gonna be 53. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 53, we're gonna square it up. 53 squared gives us 2,809, and then we're gonna divide that by four. We're gonna get 702.05. 702.25, okay. So that number would be here. All right, we would go over to white females, though we know that the N is six. And if we add all those scores up, it's 78. So we take 78, we square it up. We're gonna divide it by six, and we would get 1,014. And then the last one we're going to do is we're looking at, for black females, the N is five. And then those, that's all the scores added together is 60. We take 60, we square it up. We're going to get 3,600. We're going to divide it by five. We're going to get 720. Now, what you need to do at this point is you need to add all these Scores up. All of these scores up add up to what? 3908.92. 3908.92, correct. Okay. Now that we got this, this is all of this completed. So we're going to take this 3908.92, we're going to put it here. We're, at this point, we're just going to subtract 3,965 by 3,908.92. And once we do that subtraction, we get what uh, Haley or uh, Holly said earlier, which is 56.08, correct? So that's how we get our SSW, which is 56.08. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, good. Now that we have both our SSW and our SSB, what we need to now find is our mean square between. Okay, now what is that? It's an estimate of the between group variance that we get, so it kind of tells us how much variance there is between the groups, that we get by dividing the between group sum of squares, which we have at the SSB, by its degrees of freedom. Now how do we get the DFB or the degrees of freedom between? You're gonna get the degrees of freedom between by taking K and you're gonna subtract it by one. Now, you might think to yourself, well, what is K? I don't know why the textbook calls K the number of categories, but it's the number of samples that we have, okay? Now, so for DFB, equal to K minus one, or the number of categories, the number of samples minus one, 
how many samples did we have? Four. So our DFB is? Three. Three, good. And we're gonna put three here, okay. Now to find our mean square between, we divide our SSB by our DFB. So we know that our MSB or our mean square between is equal to 41.14 divided by three. So our MSB is equal to what? Equal to what? 13.71. Good, 13.7.71. Okay, now you want to track all this stuff, so I'm going to move all this stuff. Our MSB is 13.71. Good. Now what we need to do is we need to find our MSW, which is the mean square within, which is an estimate of the within group variance or how much variance you see within the samples themselves, okay? And we're gonna get this by dividing our SSW by our degrees of freedom within. So the within group sum of squares by the degrees of freedom within. Now, the MSW is SSW divided by DFW. How do we get DFW? The degrees of freedom within is N minus K. N being the total number of people in the entire, all the samples put together, and then K being the total number of categories of the number of samples, okay? So what is our DFW? What is our N first? So what's our N first? Is there is 21. 21, yes, so 21. We already established that K, the number of categories, number of samples is four, right? So 21 minus four gives us a DFW, which is equal to 17. So our DFW is 17. Now that we have both our SSW and our DSW, the way we get our MSW is equal to 56.08, which is our SSW, divided by our DFW, which is 17. So 56.08 divided by 17 gives us what? Three point two nine. Right, so we'll take MSW is equal to three point two nine. Okay, so our MSW is now three point. We wouldn't round up to three point three. What number did you get? Three point two nine eight. Let's go to three point three zero then. 3.30, okay, so now that we get, oh, sorry, I didn't realize things are all blurry, okay. I don't know why it loses focus like that. Okay, so hopefully you all can see all these numbers now. Now that we have our MSB and our MSW, what we need to do is find our F statistic, also referred to as our F ratio or, or our F obtained. Now, the F statistic is a ratio between group variants to within group variants, okay? So you're gonna get your F ratio or, or F obtained by dividing our MSB, which is our mean square between, divided by our mean square within, okay? So we already know that our mean square between is 13.71, Our mean square within is 3.30. So we can do this division and get our F ratio. So when we do this calculation, what is our F obtained or our F ratio?
4.15. Good. So our F obtained is 4.15. Good. So now that we have our F obtained, so again, F ratio, different term for F obtained or F statistic, is used in analysis of variance. The F statistic represents the ratio of between group variance to the within group variance. F to obtain is just the name that we use to, for our F that we calculated. And then we need to compare our F obtained to our F critical, okay? Now the F critical is the F score associated with a particular alpha level and degrees of freedom. This F score marks the beginning of the region of rejection for our null hypothesis. Now what this means is that what we want to do is once we find our F critical is, this one is going to be our F obtained, this is going to be our critical value. We want our F obtained to be either at or above the critical value. If our F obtained is either at or above the critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. If our F obtained is below our critical value, then we fail to reject the null, the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, how do we go about, so we already calculated this. How do we go about finding our F critical? Okay, so now what you want to do is you want to open up to page. Um, I think it might be 381, page 381 in the current edition, maybe 382. Um, okay, yeah, so page 381, so it's the Appendix E, distribution of the F. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to see something that looks like this. Okay. So this time you're going to see two degrees of freedom. Now, why do you see two degrees of freedom? Um, the, the first page is the 0 0.05 alpha level, the next page is where you're going to find the 0 0.01 alpha level. This chart doesn't have the 0 0.001 alpha level. Um, well, this book doesn't have the 0 0.001 alpha level or the F criticals for the 0 0.001 alpha level. So what you're going to do, you see two degrees of freedom. The reason why we have two degrees of freedom, DF1 and DF2, because we have a degree of freedom between and a degree of freedom within. So what you're first going to do at the 0 0.05 alpha level, we're going to look for the degrees of freedom between. Okay, so as we can see, the DF1 is DFB. If y'all remember, our DFB is three. So what we're going to do is we're going to count over to one, two, three. So we're in the column three. Okay. Now the next thing we're going to look is we're going to find our DF2, which is our DFW. Now, remember the DFW is 17. So we're going to go one, two, three for the DFB. We're going to come down to 17 for our DFW. Find that intersection. The intersection is 3.2. So our F critical, this is our F obtained. F obtained is 4.15. Our F critical is 3.20. Okay. Uh, I should label that a little bit better. Our F critical is 3.20, and this is our F obtained. Based upon our F obtained and our F critical, do we reject or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Well, the, the F obtained is larger than the F critical, so you reject since it's above. Good, so we reject the null hypothesis. We reject this idea or this belief that the means of all these groups in the population are equal. That one of those means is different from all the other ones. At least one of those means is different from all the other ones. Okay? It might be that two of the means are higher, two of the means are lower. That's, the ANOVA doesn't tell us that, but we do know that one of those means are, are not equal. Okay? So good, so we did that, we did that for the uh, 0.05 alpha level. Now, what I want y'all to do right now is jump over to the next page of the Appendix E. And I want y'all to tell me at the 0 0.01 alpha level, what is our new F critical? Same DFB, so same DF1, same uh, DF2, DFW, so 3 and 17. I want you to tell me what our new F critical is at the 0 0.01 alpha level. Five point one eight. Yeah, so our F critical at the point zero one alpha level is five point 
5.18. Good. So at the 0 0.01 alpha level, do we reject or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? We fail to reject. We fail to reject because our F obtained is below our F critical. Okay, good. Um, anybody have any questions about how we determine whether or not we are rejecting or failing to reject or any other part of the ANOVA procedure? Like I said, once you get your F obtained beyond that F critical, you know that you are in the region of rejection. Um, I have a question. I, have, I don't know where 5.18 came from. Okay, so what you need to do is you, you would have had to have the book open, okay? Yeah. So if you go to page to appendix E, you're going to see the distribution of the F, right? Yes. So just go over to the next page. And then you're going to sign the exact same scores for the 0 0.01 alpha level. So that was the 0 0.05. This one is the 0 0.01 alpha level. So you go look at the 3 and then the 17, and you get the 5.18. Okay. All right. Yeah. Found it. Okay. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, um, any other questions? Yes. Where did it come from, the 17? The D D DFW? Yeah. So all we did was to find a DFW, you take the N minus K. So that's the formula. DFW. Let me try to fix. So our N was 21, our K was four. So K was the number of samples that we had. We had white males, black males, white females, black females. We had four samples. We had 21 total people in the samples. So 21 minus four gave us 17. Other questions? I feel like I'm going blind right now. <laughs> I think that's easy. All right, so one last thing. So I want to show you some things with the homework. So if you take a look at this homework, some people like to look at this and they get a little confused. So when you're looking at this, Okay, so what you're seeing, you're seeing three samples, right? Group A, group B, group C, low, middle, high income people, individuals, okay? So these are three samples. Now, this is the N of five, so there's five people in the first sample, five people in the second sample, five people in the third sample, okay? Now, these are the means of those samples. So this is the mean of the first sample, this is the mean of the second sample, this is the mean of the third sample. Now, when people see these, they don't know what they're looking at, okay? Now, this, Think about this as all the scores added up, okay? So if we're looking at white males, we see that there's 16, 18, 14, 14, 16, 16. All right, but we can't see your, um, your laptop. Yeah, yeah, I just realized that. All right, so, all right. Now, we're looking at the homework, okay? So we see that there's three groups, right? One, A, B, C, okay? Now, again, we have Sample one, sample two, sample three, we have an N of five for the first sample, N of five for the second sample, N of five for the third sample, okay? Now, see the mean for the first sample, 7.4, the mean of the second sample is 4.4, .4, the mean of the third sample is 8.6. Now, what people get confused about is when they see these. Okay, so I see 37, 22, and 43, and they're like, well, what is this? So if, let's just take a look at these white males, okay? If you were to take all these scores and you add them up, that is all the scores summed together. So that's what that is. That's what that is for the first group. All the scores added up. So you don't see all the scores like you see here. The scores have just been added up for you. Same thing for the second sample is like if you take all the scores and add them together, that is equivalent to that. Okay, and then for the third sample, this 78 is equivalent to this 43. Okay. Now when you see this sum of scores squared. So that's like if you had squared all the scores and added them up all up together, that's what you see there, okay? Um, now, with these pieces of information, you can answer all of these questions for the homework, okay? 
So just, you know, that's what all these things mean. Some students are confused about that, but that's what those mean. Anybody have any questions about that? No. So that 285 is the same number as that 1484. Yes, the numbers have been squ squared up and then they add, they've been added together. Okay. And we work with the mean the each group. Yeah, you need the means for those groups too. And then those are here. Okay. All right, so having said that, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.